Amen. It's good to see you. Amen. Amen. Good to be here again tonight. And thank the Lord for his blessings of the day. And even though my wife did hurt her foot, <laughs> still a blessing. Good to be alive. Now, these young ladies did not know what I was going to be preaching tonight when they were talking about Jonah, but that's one of the places we're going to go. So, we'll be in uh, several places. This is a short passage. This is Deuteronomy chapter 28. And then we'll read one verse out of Isaiah. But our main text tonight will be in the book of Jonah. Book of Jonah. Deuteronomy chapter number 28. Again, with verse 63. I've tried to be sensitive to the Spirit of God and what to preach. And uh, I believe I preached yesterday what the Lord would have me preach. I don't always, uh, the saying down south hit a home run, <laughs> which I don't particularly like that when it comes to preaching the Word of God, but. I mean, a, a, a man a man usually knows when he's preached what God tells him to preach. And so, it's all good. I mean, you know, from Genesis to Revelation. But I just ask the Lord, I try to be, uh, you know, when I pray and ask the Lord to give me what I think will be the blessing to the folks and what the need is. And so, that's where we're going to be tonight. Deuteronomy chapter number 28. I did enjoy the singing. Seriously, that was a blessing. I wish every church would would uh, had good scriptural biblical singing and music, and we're getting further and further away from that, especially down south. Down south, they've sold out what they call this southern gospel, and it's not a thing in the world but country and western with uh, religious words to it. And the so-called contemporary music's nothing but rock and roll with religious words to it. So it doesn't make it scriptural. Doesn't make it biblical. And I, for one, uh, despise it. And uh, Satan can't get your Bible. He'll indirectly get it by taking your music. Yeah. And so I appreciate these good folks singing and uh, singing scriptural, biblical songs. That's a blessing. These young ladies, they have good harmony, don't they? Amen. Amen. That's great. I was really, uh, I was really uh, pleasantly surprised by that. That's really good. All right, verse 63 in Deuteronomy chapter 28. The Bible says, It shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught. And ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. <clears throat> Among these nations shall thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life in the morning, Thou shalt say, Would God it were even. And at even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning. For the fear of thine heart, wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, by the way whereof I spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again, and thou shalt... And you shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. They get all bent out of shape over in Exodus chapter 11, and of course the modern version, they don't like that where the Jews borrowed of the Egyptians gold and silver. That's exactly what happened, because they had to take it back down there again. Yeah. Amen? So, I mean, they didn't get it to keep. You know, that gold that they took out of Egypt, that silver was supposed to be for the tabernacle, but of course they used it to make a golden calf and Moses ground it to powder, strolled it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink it. I don't know if you've ever uh, 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 read uh, Chemistry of the Blood by M.R. Dehan, but when you take gold and grind it to powder and put it on water, it turns blood red. 
And so that's what Moses made the children of Israel do because of their sin of making a golden calf. So the word, the word borrowed of the Egyptians is right, in spite of Schofield's notes or anybody's commentary. Amen. Just believe the book like it is and you'll be fine. Amen? Amen. That's always good. Amen. <laughs> I thought I'd throw that in tonight, okay? All right, look over in Isaiah chapter number 28. Isaiah 28, we'll look at one verse. Isaiah 28. In Isaiah 28, verse 20, the Bible says this, For the bed is shorter than that a man can stretch himself on it, and the covering narrower than that he can wrap himself in it. That's tossing and turning. Amen. Getting no rest. Now folks, if you don't recognize this, this we find in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and Isaiah is conviction. It's conviction upon a man or woman to have a fellowship with God or out of the will of God or under conviction to get saved. Now, I enjoyed getting saved. I really did. That was a real blessing, but I could have done without that conviction. <laughs> I mean, I mean, really, you can't do without it, but I mean, the conviction is the bad part. Salvation and the relief is the good part. Yeah. Amen. And the Lord always deals and convicts when a person gets saved. But let's look in the book of Jonah now. What we're gonna what we're gonna deal with tonight? We're gonna deal a little bit with the life of Jonah. And the name of the message tonight is "Dwelling in No Man's Land." Dwelling in No Man's Land. You say to, well, well, brother Mitch, what what in the world is No Man's Land? Well, No Man's Land is a type of DMZ. I guess I could have called this message "Dwelling in the DMZ." That's a demilitarized zone. That's the place where a Christian soldier, man or woman, who's been trained to live for God, gets in a place where they're, they're, they're too saved to get out in the world, but they become too worldly to be any spiritual good. So you're just in the middle. You can't go back out in the world because you know better than that. You're not happy there. But yet you can't be spiritual because you have too much of the world in your life. Amen? And that is no man's land. That's a demilitarized zone, a DMZ, if you will. That's a terrible place to be. You say, how do you know? Because I've been there. You know, in 37 years or 38 years of salvation, I had not always, you know, walked as close to God as I wanted. There's been times when I was at a guilty distance from the Lord, and I couldn't be happy. So that's what we're going to be dealing with tonight, and we're going to deal with, be dealing with a man by the name of Jonah. So let's look at Jonah chapter 1. Now, how can you and I tonight, how can we know for certain that we're in no man's land? How can we know that an individual is in no man's land? Well, there's several things here in the life of Jonah that allow us to see. Bible with Bible, Scripture with Scripture. And I want you to know, first of all, in Jonah chapter 1, looking at verse 1. Now, first of all, when a believer is in no man's land... The believer becomes displeased with the things of God. All right? Look at Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. That was the call of God that God Almighty put upon Jonah. In the Bible as it stands, Jonah is one of the most perfect types of a Jew in the tribulation witnessing the tribulation Gentiles. That's what Jonah, that's what Jonah is in type. So there was a definite call given to Jonah in chapter 1, verse 1, and God said, Arise, go to Nineveh. And what did Jonah do? Look down in verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarsus from the, from the presence of the Lord. You see that? Now folks, I don't know if you know in your Bible, if you read your Bible, but Jonah was a prophet of God. The Bible is plain and clear in that, 2 Kings 14, that Jonah was a prophet from Gath Hefer, which is in Galilee. Now the Pharisees over uh, uh, dealing with Jesus Christ said, Search the scriptures for no, no prophet ariseth out of Galilee. That shows how much they knew. Jonah was from Galilee and the Bible says 
uh, 2 Kings 14.25 that Jonah was a prophet. He was. Amen. Now look at it. Notice he's displeased with the things of God. God calls him to do one thing and Jonah does the exact opposite. Isn't that a sad state of affairs? But that's what's going on today in a lot of Baptist churches with a lot of people. Uh, God gives a definite call upon an individual to do something and they balk against it and go the opposite way. Jonah was called to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is in Assyria. That's that way. Jonah gets on his ship and goes that way. Amen. Isn't that sad? I want you to notice something. Look at uh, verse number 3. But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarsus from the presence of the Lord and went, look at it, down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarsus, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it. See that? And the Bible said to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Look down in verse number 5. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. You know something, child of God? When you and I get out of fellowship with God, we decide that's as far as we're going to go. We're in a spiritual plane and we're going to stop right there. You know something? We never stop right there. We always go down. Yes, there is no such thing as being in neutral for God. Amen. That's right. You and I that are saved by the grace of God, we're either making progress in the Lord or we're losing ground. You cannot stop and just ride this thing out in neutral. It can't happen. Yeah. It won't happen. You say, how do you know? I've been there. I wish I could say differently. I'm 57 years old, but I got saved when I was 18 years old and coming up through eight, my, in my late teens and my 20s and into my 30s and 40s. Folks, listen, the, sometimes life gets rough, gets hard. I've never gone back out in the world, folks, listen, but there's this time that I was as cold as an Eskimo's nose toward the Lord. And listen, you just don't stop and put it in neutral. Say, well, I'm just going to stay right here and I'm going to remember everything I've learned and I'm going to keep the power of God and I'm going to keep my prayer life. You don't. Do it. Amen. You go back. That's right. Now, I don't mean you lose your salvation. But you go backward on the Lord. You lose ground. And you give place to the devil. Right. Amen. Amen. And some Christians even gone so far that the devil has taken them captive at his will. They have to be recovered. Yeah. Amen. And that's sad. This, 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 this commentary here on Jonah is a very sad thing. Very sad. And it gets worse. Look at this. I want you to notice, he becomes displeased with the things of God. I want you to notice number two, looking at verse four. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Listen, not only does a, a person that's in no man's land, not a person that's in a demilitarized zone, not only do they become displeased with the things of God, that's how you get there. But listen, there also comes a time when you get dissatisfied with the things of the world. Right. Mm. That ship right there was Jonah's way out. That was Jonah's way away from the will of God. But look what happens. Read with me. Verse number 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind in the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down in the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. The only man on the boat that knows the real God. And he was asleep. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> what was it they said a while ago about being a, being a light, being a, you know, being a light, being, I mean, folks, that's the way we are. With only Bible some folks will ever read. You know what happens to a lot of people? They get saved and they start living for God and growing with the Lord and getting close to God and they realize there's a price to pay for this. Yeah. And so they stop. And that's as far as they go. You know why? The Bible said much knowledge and much sorrow. Ecclesiastes 1.18 The more you learn, the more you're going to be accountable for it. Amen. And I've had people say, well, if I don't learn it, I won't be accountable for it. I say, wrong. Yes, God knows how 
your spiritual aptitude. God knows what you understand. Listen, if you're capable of knowing it, and you just don't learn it because you don't want to know it and be accountable for it, you still answer for it because God knows that you're capable of it. Amen. Amen. I've had people actually tell me that. But that's not the way it works. Amen. The Lord's a just God, but He doesn't play games. That's for sure. Jonah chapter 1, verse 6, So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, and so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, Every one to his fellow, Come, and let us cast lots, and we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then they said unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. My, 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 what a testimony. The only man on the boat that knew the real, true God, and he's out of fellowship with God, running from God. Amen. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be common to us? For the sea wrought was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up, and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be common to you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the man rode hard to bring it to land. Look at, look at the dignity of those men. They rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not, for the sea rolled and was tempestuous against them. Whereof they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish with this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done it as, as it pleased thee. Boy, Jonah had some converts, <laughs> didn't he? Amen. Well, look at this. Jonah's way out, he had to give it up. Now, folks, it doesn't matter. Maybe uh, this is this. I'm not saying anybody here is in this condition, or that you're even going to get in this condition. But it's a warning not to. Okay, it's a warning from somebody that's been saved for 38 years not to go there because it's not a pleasant place to be. But it might not be a boat. I mean, it might be a car. It might be a girlfriend or a boyfriend. It might be, you know, your job. It might be money. It might be a boat or it might be shotguns. Or might, I love all those things. Listen, folks, God gave us those things to enjoy. Amen. There's nothing wrong with those things as long as they don't come ahead of God. Anything you and I put ahead of God is an idol. Amen. And God will remove it. You don't have to make a statue out of wood and overlay it with gold and fall down and worship it for being an idol. Anything that's ahead of God in our life becomes an idol. And God's not pleased with that. He'll have no other gods before him. If you belong to God, listen folks, you're bought with a price not rented. Amen. God didn't rent you. He bought you. Amen. That's right. Why well, that knocks losing your salvation in the head, don't it? Yeah. You are bought with a price. God didn't rent me till he got tired of me and then sold me back to the devil. No, 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 no. And I can't sell myself back to the devil either. Right. But listen, folks, it doesn't matter what it, what it was. For Jonah, it was the boat, but Jonah eventually had to get out. And let me tell you something, folks. There is a God-shaped hole in the heart of every individual born in this world. You know that? And only God can fill it. Amen. Now, those things of the world will work for a while. There's pleasure in sin for a season. They'll work for a while. You can, I, I know people that used to be on fire for God today, instead of being right with God, they're into politics. Right. And Lord, help, if you, get, if you can be happy in that stuff, you'll be doing better than me. Amen? Amen? Right. You vote for the lesser of two evils or the evil of two lessers. I don't know which one. Right. But folks, I'm telling you, Politics won't do it. Money won't do it. Fame, fortune won't do it. You can get your name in lights. That doesn't matter. You can get your name in the Hall of Fame. That doesn't matter. All that's going to burn up. Amen. The only thing that is going to last for eternity is what we do for Jesus Christ. Amen. And the older I get, the more I learn that. Amen. Thank God for the things He gives. The Bible says in the book of Acts that God gives us food to enjoy. How about that? Amen. And I enjoy it. I sure do. Amen. Amen. 
probably too much. But God gives us a husbands and wives to enjoy and family members to enjoy, children to enjoy. Amen? God blesses us that way. But none of those things are, are, are to come ahead of Jesus Christ. None. For it's an idol. And God has a way of removing idols. Amen? Number three, I want you to notice with me. When a man or a woman is in no man's land, when they're in that demilitarized zone where they can no longer fight with a good conscience, they become intolerant of spiritual believers. Look at Jonah chapter 3 and notice with me. They become intolerant of the people of God. When you get to a point where you're backslidden in the Lord, of course the word backslidden is not in the New Testament, but the doctrine is there. You get out of fellowship with God and people that are truly spiritual, they irk you, they bother you, they irritate you, they aggravate you, they get under your skin, right? Am I the only one that's ever had that problem? <laughs> Jonah chapter 3, look at it. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. God's call didn't change. After he went to Whale University, God's call did not change. He told him to the same, same commission, same thing to do. You go to those Gentiles. Amen. Amen. Now look at it. Look at it. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Notice that great city is the same designation put upon Babylon in the book of Revelation. Isn't that amazing? That great city. You know, you know in the book of Revelation, you can distinguish Babylon from Jerusalem because in the book of Revelation, Babylon is always that great city or this great city and Jerusalem is always the great city. That's right. That great city, 13 letters. The great city, 12 letters, the number of Israel. In your King James Bible, and that's the only place you're going to find that. Every version in the world messes that up. Only one gets it right. Can you guess which one? Yeah. You got some book. Yeah. This, is, this is some Bible. Yeah. I've been studying it now for 38 years and I haven't scratched the surface of it yet. And I'm serious. I'm serious. But look at here. Same commission. So Jonah rose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. And Jonah began to enter into a, a city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For the word, excuse me, for word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth uh, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger and we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them and he did it not. Folks, that's mercy extended. Yes, sir. Amen. Now, boy, shouldn't Jonah have been shouting? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't Jonah have been praising the Lord? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jehovah God of Israel, that you spared these people my, through my preaching. Shouldn't he? But a man that's at a guilty distance from God, he's dissatisfied with spiritual believers. You know, if, if Jonah was nothing else, he was a patriot. You know that? You know that Jonah was a prophet. Do you know that Israel went in captivity in Assyria in 746 B.C., less than 100 years from when Jonah was preaching? Jonah, being a prophet, surely knew that Assyria was going to take Israel into captivity. So that's one reason why he didn't want to go down and preach to them. Don't you think if he'd have been thinking spiritually, he would have ascertained the fact that, hey, uh, uh, maybe if they get right with God, they won't attack my people and take them into captivity. That's what he should have thought. But a person that's not thinking correctly, they can't rejoice when spiritual things take place. 
You say, prove that, Brother Mitch. Well, let's let the Scripture prove it. I want you to notice number four. When, when a man's, in, or a woman for that matter, but a man with a call of God on him, if he's in no man's land, he becomes insensitive to the work of God. He just preached in the whole city. 120,000 people got right with God. I'd have been turning cartwheels down the hallway here. Amen? But listen. Verse 1, chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord. Look, look, what, he, look what he accused God of. Look at this. And he said, Hey folks, this is a saved man. Right here, Jonah is. This is just as saved in the Old Testament sense as anybody sitting in this building. Now look. I pray thee, O Lord. And he prayed to the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take I beseech thee my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? I mean, folks, listen. Jonah had lost his spiritual vision. He had lost his spiritual insight. Though he, though he agreed that God was a God of mercy, he still wanted God to destroy those people because he had told them that's what's going to happen. That's why he was angry. Because God spared them. There's a man that's in no man's land. The wrath of God was supposed to be poured out on these people by God because Jonah said so. And so he said, God, take my life. It's not good for me to live. Just kill me. Just kill me. 120,000 people just got right with God. He wants God to kill them. Kill him. Isn't that amazing? You become insensitive to the work of God. And that's the way it is to a child of God. You know, any time in my life, you mind a personal testimony? Does that bother you? I hope it don't. <laughs> I mean, I know me better than I know anybody. But the times in my life when I'm the furthest from God is the times when I become less sensitive to what God is doing. Amen. And folks, you get out of this book, let me warn you, the independent Baptist, and that's what I am from the top of my bald head to the bottom of my size 11 feet. I'm an independent Baptist. I'm not ashamed of it. I know why I am. I wasn't raised independent Baptist. I know why I am. I know my heritage. I know the independent Baptist came from the old separate Baptist. So I know why, what I am and why I am. But listen, folks. Being an independent Baptist don't mean a person's right with God. Believing the King James Bible don't always mean a person's right with God. You can be believe this book and be at church every service and be just as cold as a mackerel when it comes to the things of God. Right. I know because I've been there. And I know many other people who have been there. It's not a pleasant thing. It's not a pleasant thing to be saved and, and when the Spirit of God is moving and things of God are happening, you can't you 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 have a surface you have a surface rejoicing, but deep down in your heart, there's something in there that's this this not right. It's not right. There is a vapor between you and God, or there's a vapor between you and other believers. And the only way you're going to get that out is repent. Mm -hmm. It's it's sad. Number five, and I'll be done tonight. But a person who is in no man's land, dwelling in no man's land. Becomes discontent with his own condition. I got down and prayed and said, Lord, it's a wonder you don't kill me. But listen, you become discontent with your own condition. I mean, you can wallow in it for a while, but pretty soon, if you're saved and the Spirit of God dwells in you, you can't stay there. Amen. You can't. Look at chapter 4, verse 5. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. And there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smoked the gourd that it withered. 
And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted. Probably bald headed like me. <laughs> that he fainted and wished in himself to die. And he said, it's better for me to die than to live. I mean, look at this. God looks at Jonah and God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Boy, that's bitterness, isn't it? It sure is. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and also much cattle. Now listen folks, think about this just a minute. Which is better? To die in a backslidden state, a bitter state of mind and heart or to get right with God and restore yourself. Let God restore you and rejoice in what God does. I can remember many, many years ago and being in a state like this and when I finally hit my knees before the Lord and cried out and wept some bitter tears. It's almost like getting saved again. And the love of God floods in your heart. And what you do, you, you, you begin to immediately, it's like when you get saved, the thing that you put such stock in that was so important that you just had to do, things you had to have, places you had to go, you realize all those things are secondary when it comes to the will of God and the things of God. Yeah. Now I hope, I hope there's not anybody here tonight in this condition or anybody in here that's headed that way. I really do. So this is a warning from an old North Carolina preacher, okay? Don't go there. You know how to, you know how to avoid going there? Stay on your knees before God. Uh, you know how to quit not to go there? Stay in the book. Stay in the book. You know how, do you, do you know, do you know how not to go there? Quit looking at people and comparing yourself with them. The Bible says when you do that, you're not wise. Yeah. When you compare yourself among, well, I'm as good as they are. Well, you might be. Maybe, maybe they're not as good as the next person. Yeah. Amen. Folks, listen. We keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. He'll never fail you. Amen. Never fail you. Don't ever go to that no man's land. Don't ever get to the point where you can't be a Christian soldier for the Lord and you walk a guilty distance from God Almighty. It's not fun. It's not fun for your witness to have no fire to it and just go through the motions for God. A word of warning. Because I love you. Before I was saved, number one, that's all I cared about. When I got saved, God gave me a concern for other people. Amen. And I've got a concern for all my brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't know who's here tonight. And I don't know your spiritual condition. But I do know this. I do know this beyond all shadow of a doubt. You do not want to go to no man's land. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for <coughs> this instruction book that we have. This book that gives us the laws of life when dealing with you and when dealing with other people. We just pray that your blessing will be done tonight. And we pray, Father, that we take this example of a prophet of God, a sure enough saved man that got bitter against you. And we remember, Lord, that bitterness against you will never work. Never work. And bitterness against other people will never work. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you've done and all you're going to do. We'll praise you for it and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, for his sake, amen. 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 One thing, the greatest illustration I've ever heard in my life is about bitterness, that root of bitterness. Getting bitter against other people is like you getting up every morning and taking a drop of arsenic and putting it in your water and drinking it and looking for the person to die that you're bitter against. They won't. You will. Amen. Brother Phil, would you come? Grab a song of invitation.
we sing it, the Lord spoke to you tonight. Maybe you feel yourself getting cold on the Lord. You heard a warning tonight. Stop it before it's too late. Amen. Maybe you've gone a little bit further than that. Maybe you are up in the DMZ. Why don't you get back? Why don't you get back in here with your unit? Amen. Let's stand. The Lord spoke to you tonight. The altar's open. If you need to pray, why don't you come down? Right. Let's turn in our hymnals to hymn number 162. Take time to be holy. Number 162. The altar's open. Hold on the Lord tonight. Why don't you come?